Now, a comfort doctor is the way we describe a doctrine designed to give comfort to one that does not desire to give up some sinful activity or practice, so they will invent this twisted form of thinking to continue in ungodliness. So as to not offend church members with a call to repentance. There are pulpits declaring peace and safety when in fact there is none. Now this warped logic can lead one to the conclusion of there is no hell. Because the subject of hell is definitely an unpleasant topic and is very unpopular in certain circles to discuss or to even hint that we may know someone that is going there. That is why it is a subject that has been dismissed or diminished by denominational leaders and their professed believers in God. More sadly, if any in the Church of Christ have adopted this airy position. It is such teachings and attitudes that cause us to define it as a comfort doctrine. Now this morning, we are going to examine the reality of hell and explain some of the false arguments used for there is no hell. Several years ago, the Barna Group, a denominational research organization out of Ventura, California, released the results of a three-year survey on the afterlife. Now here are some of their findings, so bear with me. 81% of Americans believe in an afterlife of some sort, with another 9% unsure. 76% believe that heaven exists, while 71% believe that hell exists. 46% of believers in heaven thought it would be a safe and eternal existence in God's presence, while 30% believe it is an actual place of, of rest and reward where souls go after death. 39% believe that hell is a state of eternal separation from God's presence, while 32% believe it is an actual place of torment and suffering where people's souls go after death. 13% believe that hell is just a symbol of an unknown bad outcome after death. 60, or, uh, only 0.5% believe that they will experience hell firsthand after death. 64% believe that they will go to heaven, while 5% believe they will uh, go back or come back in another life form, and 5% believe that they will cease to exist. Now, of those who believe that they will go to heaven, 43% base it upon confessing their sins and accepting Jesus as their Savior, while 15% believe that they have to obey the Ten Commandments, with 15% saying basically just be a good person, and 6% believing that God loves all people and will not let them perish. Now, it was also discovered that the more education and income one has, the less likely that they are to believe that there is a heaven or a hell. What that means is a little smarts and money makes you a whole lot dumb and poor spiritually. Now, George Barnum, who's the president of this Barnum group, noted that church members make contradictions in this survey. He says, many committed born-again Christians believe that people have multitude op options for gaining entrance into heaven. What they're saying in essence is, personally, I am trusting Jesus Christ as my means of gaining God's permanent favor and a place in heaven, but someone else could get to heaven based upon, a, uh, upon living an exemplary life. So one has to trust in Jesus and another does not, but just have a decent lifestyle. In other words, 
Millions of Americans have redefined grace to mean that God is so eager to save people from hell that he will change his nature and his universal principles that are stated in the Bible for their individual benefit. Now it is shocking how many people develop their faith according to their feelings and cultural assumptions rather than clear biblical teachings. Now there are various approaches to the subject of hell by different people. Some teach either a milder form of hell, such as eternal separation from God, but not the suffering, or a purgatory in which you spend time in torment as punishment for your sins to be purged, but then family and friends who are here on earth with a few dollars have purchased for you a get out of hell card so that you can go to heaven. While some others teach that hell does not exist at all. In addition to atheists, such religious cults as the Jehovah Witness teach that the ungodly will simply be annihilated or absolutely go out of existence as if they never were. Still others teach the sweet doctrine of universalism that God will save everyone, even Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, who have a combined conservative, conservative estimate of murdering 60 million will go. So there is no need for hell, except perhaps for the devil and his fallen angels, because they are really bad to the bone, so to speak. Now, as we've already mentioned, too many, regardless of their views, believe that it is not relevant to them or to others, because it is their opinion that they will not be lost eternally. However, as we examine what the Bible actually teaches about this subject, it will become very clear that all their unsupported teaching is completely wrong. Let me begin by saying on the reality of heaven that I do not enjoy talking about nor do I profess to know all the details or the ramifications about this realm any more than its complete opposite, which is heaven. Yet if God had given me the power to change just one subject in the scriptures, it would be the existence of this abode of eternal torment. Because I do not like what my finite mind does comprehend. But I cannot change what the Bible teaches, nor do I have the right to question the sovereignty of God in these matters. God has said that things are as they have been established, so I must live and die with it. My responsibility is to declare the whole revealed truth about this God-forsaken place. If the Bible is true, and it is, this hell is a real dwelling. It is not some habitation that Jesus made up so fire and brimstone preachers can scare people into obedience and submission. If the Bible is accurate, and it is. There are far too many passages to deny the reality of this lodging by name. Listen from, uh, to Jesus in just the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 29 and 30. If your right hand or eye makes you stumble, tear it out, cut it off, and throw it from you. For it is better for you that one part of your body perishes than for your whole body to go into hell. Chapter 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, 
but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Chapter 23, verse 33. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how shall you escape the sentence of hell? To Jesus' words, add these verses describing what happens. As all becomes clear, it is a real place. Hell is eternal. Matthew 25, verse 11, 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now notice how the same concept of eternity is attributed to both heaven and hell in this text by Jesus himself. Each will last as long as the other, and that is forever. Mark 9, verse 48, where their worm does not die, is eternal decay, complete, foul, ungoing rottenness. Hell is eternal, and hell is torment. Luke 3, verse 17, Jesus says he will gather the wheat, the saved, into his barn, which is the kingdom of heaven, but he will burn up the chaff, the unsaved, the unsaved with unquenchable fire. So this figure of speech is the idea of an intense burning sensation that has no ending. Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day and no and night no rest means no relief which removes all hope perpetually hell is eternal torment and hell is darkness Matthew 22 verse 13 bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's intense pain. Jude, verse 13. For whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. I cannot comprehend outer black darkness. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. God is light. 1 John 1 verse 5. In heaven there is no need for the light of the lamp or the bright sun because God himself illuminates this area. Revelation 22 verse 5. And hell is absolute outer darkness because God is not there. You know that Jesus spoke more about hell than any New Testament writer. I wonder why. Perhaps because he created it in its fullness. These descriptions are designed to help us perceive the worst possible place that we can comprehend. Hell means unlimited torment forever in blackness with no relief or rest, no hope. All evil. Or let me allow me to say that the majority of humanity are dumped into this cesspool of the most unimaginable realm that was prepared for the devil and his angels. With all the truthfulness that I can express over my years of study of this spiritual dominion of eternal destruction, it is far much worse than what is recorded on the printed pages that are sitting upon your laps. The point of such warnings from Jesus and the New Testament writers is you do not want to go there. Now having said this, some will argue, but God is too good with so much love. And doesn't eternal punishment seem too cruel? 
Especially when we consider that we are here not by our choice. While God loves, he is also just and holy. Therefore, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 10 verse 31 and 12 verse 29. Justice demands punishment for lawbreakers. As sinners, we have broken God's moral law and have offended Him. So who are we, the creation, to tell Him, the Creator, what a just punishment is. God paid the price for our sins. So we need to also consider what God did to atone for our transgressions. God's view of sin is seen, is seen in the sending of his son. He demanded Jesus' death to appease our sins. Now another truth is that God does not send anyone to hell because he wants to. We, you and I, choose to go there. By refusing to obey God, we are making the choice to be lost eternally and we do not get to determine the severity of the penalty. Now imagine, if you would, a criminal being allowed to set his own sentence for his crime. Jesus paid the price for our sins. And we can sadly choose to reject that free gift of eternal life. If we truly consider what sin means to God, then we would be better able to realize the seriousness of the punishment that awaits the one who transgressions are not taken care of by the blood of Christ. Contemplate what God is offering you if you obey the New Testament. Eternity in heaven with him and all things that are good. As to our being here not by our choice, we may not like it. But that does not change the reality of we are here. I have three words for you. Get over it. Our option is only to choose whether or not we will obey God or refuse. Why people don't believe in Bible's hell can be because of also there are two following comfort doctrines that we're going to examine. Now again, a comfort doctrine is designed to give relief and remove the fear of consequences to one refusing to repent of some evil activity. Our next false comfort doctrine is it doesn't matter what we believe. Now this is an answer used to justify the many denominations around us and to set aside our differences for the sake of unity and to simply agree to disagree on doctrinal issues as they like to say. Now the fancy term for this is unity in diversity. Meaning let us just find a way to have this unity and get along. The result is one or both must compromise some part of their belief system in order to have this unity. You as a New Testament Christian are being asked to set aside God's standard to achieve unity with falsehood. Because, you see, they trivialize doctrinal accuracy. We are being asked to unite with them in such announcements as attend the church of your choice. Any Bible-believing church in your community will do. 
After all, we're all going to heaven just by different routes. These statements promote ignorance. Why? In other words, why study if it doesn't matter? It removes true accountability. If it doesn't matter which church, then find one that requires minimal change in your life. Why bother to even contend for the faith, Jude verse 3, if it doesn't matter what we believe, as all rivers dump or flow into the same ocean. These statements about any church redefine nearly every biblical doctrine. A few are sin, grace, baptism, and who we fellowship as our saved brethren. So why is it doesn't matter what we believe a comfort doctrine? Because it removes the need to accept what God's word tells us to do. Simply stated, it can lead to the mentality that you can formulate what you want to believe, then you can find a church that allows you to do precisely that. Therefore, you find comfort without total obedience to the truth of God. You see, Satan has a very cunning way of deception, doesn't he? But what does the Bible say? The need for unity is clearly taught in the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, Paul admonishes a divided congregation and tells them to do all things God's way. The Lord's Prayer in John 17, verse 20 and 21 is to do all things God's way. In Ephesians 4, verse 1 to 6, endeavoring to keep the unity of spirit and the bond of peace, it is to do all things God's way. Nowhere do you read of this concept of compromising doctrine to achieve unity. What God says is true and it must be accepted as truth without change or amendments. So what is meant by unity in the Bible? What it means is only agreement in all truth. That produces unity. Let me read that 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 passage. That you all agree and there be no divisions among you. Then in chapter 4, 17, Paul says, He will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, Paul did not have a different message for Ephesus, Corinth, and the churches of Galatia. Now, they were different letters with assorted topics addressed, but they were not opposing each other. Wherever the same subject was discussed in any epistle, they were in complete harmony. For example, baptism in the first century was always immersion. To the church at Philippi, Paul challenges them, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, chapter 2, verse 2. Yes, this message was to one congregation, but the principles apply universally as truth does not contradict itself. Paul's Galatian epistle was written to several congregations, and yet there was one message for all of them to be united upon. So it is today with the Lord's New Testament church worldwide to be one body. The one message of the New Testament produces unity, but believe what you want promotes division. And by definition, 
Every denomination includes division. So why would anybody be part of that destructive movement? But it does not matter what you believe, folks. Fail to consider biblical principles such as all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for the correction, for training in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. If anything goes, believe what you want. Then that does not fulfill the next verse, verse 17. That the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Noah, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. In essence, Jesus said that there are those who claim to be Christians by believing in him. And though they were even obeying him, they thought they were still lost. Those who will be saved for heaven are those who do the will of the Father who's in heaven. Read the Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23 text more closely. There is no room for I can believe or do things my way. These religious folks in the judgment scene before Jesus, they all had different views. And since truth is absolute, that makes their positions all wrong. They were false teachers. And the Bible does not tolerate such individuals. In his second epistle, Peter warns the first century New Testament church, there will be also false teachers among you who secretively introduce destructive heresies, bringing swift destruction upon them. Chapter 2, verse 1. And John, in his second epistle, not everyone, anyone, he says, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. Verse 9. Then John wrote in verse 10, for us not to receive them or even to give them a greeting. God has taken a strong stand against these evil folks that tamper with his written word. Because these are the ones that cause the many in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 to 23 to engage in falsehood, perhaps even unrealizing they were. And a large number of the majority of mankind end up on the wide way leading to destruction in Matthew 7 verse 13 because of these false teachers. Which brings us to our last evil comfort doctrine advanced by several false teachers in the neighboring churches. In Genesis chapter 3, we find the serpent approaching Eve and asking her if God had said that they couldn't eat of any trees in the garden. And she replies, from the, uh, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's verse 2 to verse 5. The very first lie that Satan spoke to mankind was a comfort doctrine. The devil was denying God's penalty for sin. And ever since that time, Humanity has sought for a way to God without completely surrendering to Him. Sadly, they are usually find someone who will tell them, you know, they're such fine people just the way they are. Justification is bundled up in the comfort doctrine called once saved, 
always saved. Now this doctrine is defined as a belief that once someone is saved by God through the blood of Christ, his salvation is secured eternally. No matter what he does, he cannot be lost or fall from the grace of God. Now this teaching is sometimes called the perseverance of the saints. This doctrine was developed and promoted by John Calvin as it was part of his system of theology known as Calvinism, Calvinism, Calvinism that started in 1536 in his publication, The Institutes of the Christian Religion. Now, it is worthy to note that prior to this time, this doctrine was not being advocated really by anybody. But Calvin gave it life. Now, this drastic teaching or doctrine to which this is being taught can be seen in the following two quotes. A Baptist preacher by the name of Sam Morris in an article he says on this subject, we take the position that a Christian's sin do not damn his soul. The way a Christian lives what he says, his character, his conduct, or his attitude to earth the people have nothing whatsoever to do with the salvation of his soul. That is settled in Christ and Christ alone. All the sins he may commit from idolatry to murder will not make his soul in any more danger. Then you've got a Baptist preacher by the name of Bill Foster. He wrote, if I kill my wife and mother, and debauch a thousand women. I could not go to hell. In fact, I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to. If on the judgment day I should find my loved ones are lost and should lose all desire to be saved and should beg God to send me to hell with them, he could not do it. Now this is found in the Weekly Workers of April 12, 1959. Now Morris and Foster demonstrate the true convictions of those who believe in this doctrine. Yet some Baptists would even question these preachers' extreme statements, which means that they doubt their own doctrine. But what does the Bible teach about once saved, always saved? In Romans 11, verse 22, Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fail, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if, let me repeat that, if, one more time for good measure, if you continue in his goodness or his kindness, otherwise you also will, let me repeat that, will, once more, for good measure, will be cut off. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I buffet my body. And make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. The great Apostle Paul says that he could be disqualified or cast away. This Greek word, adokimus, it signifies not standing the test, rejected, disapproved, with loss of Future reward. This comes out of Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament words. Look at Galatians 5 verse 4. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. In other words, you've been cut off from Christ and you have slipped away from grace. There are over a dozen more verses on this discussing the importance of of faithfulness, the need to obey God, and the consequences of failing to obey, and the danger of apostasy. When God says it once, that is enough. Yet he has repeated this throughout the New Testament many times so that his human creatures might get the point. It is impossible to miss the need for an obedient life in thoughts, words, and deeds to ensure a home in heaven when this life is over. Paul gives a lengthy discourse or a passage in Romans 8, verse 31 to 39. 
He says, if God is for us, who is against us? Then he lists every conceivable created thing that shall not be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The only thing that Paul failed to mention, which indeed does separate us from God, is our sin. We can transgress to the point that though we were once saved, we are now not saved. Once saved, always saved is a dangerous teaching for two reasons that I'll mention briefly. First off, it gives a false security. It takes away true accountability. This doctrine teaches that it is not necessary to obey God's will. And the result is that you can set the terms of your service to God and the Lord has no choice but to accept it. And secondly, it leads to ignorance and complacency. What real need is there to study and to attend church services when such has no bearing on your salvation? 1 John 1 verse 7 But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. This verse teaches the security of the believer which means by remaining faithful to God until death having fellowship you are heaven bound. But due to human free will, you can at any time choose to forsake God. Cease walking in the light and now go crawling in the devil's darkness, which in turn means that God will abandon you to eternal hell. Now I hope this morning that we can see that the comfort doctrines of Satan are both extremely false and dangerous. Brethren, true comfort comes through knowing the truth of God's word. In 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 18, Therefore comfort one another with these words. Romans 15, verse 4, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, that through perseverance and encouragement of the Scripture, we might have hope. Which means we must examine closely His Word, which brings about comfort in obeying such a study. Let me ask, are you comfortable with your spiritual condition? If you have unforgiven sin, take care of it this morning while you are here. When you do what God says, either believe, repent, and water baptism for the washing away of sins for the non-Christian, or repent and prayer in order to have the forgiveness of sins for an erring Christian. When you comply with God's needed commands, there is every reason for you to find true comfort. But if you refuse this morning to obey Him, then be afraid. Be very afraid. For hell is real. God is waiting on your choice. Why not make the right one and come right now as together we stand and as we sing.